Linda has a knack for being at the forefront of uh, you know, big revolutions in life sciences. So uh, she started her career back in, uh, I mean, many places, but I think notably at Affymetrix when, when, when genomics was just really getting off the ground and the research side and we had things like microarrays and it was a whole new way of uh, doing um, biological research. She was there. Um, almost 10 years ago after that, uh, I mean, that was 10 years back from now, she started uh, co-founded 23andMe, which I think is a company many people are familiar with. So I think a pretty bold thing to do to start a consumer genomics company back in uh, almost 10 years ago when even today we're still trying to figure out what the heck to do and, and how to integrate it into our, our health system. So, so again, really a, a, ahead of her time there and has now, uh, I think, uh, leapt onto uh, another uh, forefront here and starting a company called Curious, which is... I think at the forefront of, of wellness and, and some of the scientific wellness stuff that we talked about, uh, that uh, like Nathan Price and others talked about here. So my great pleasure to welcome Linda, Linda up on stage and uh, look forward to your talk. Good morning. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's always fun to come to New York, um, and the rain is amazing <laughs> coming from California. Um, but um, I often get the question about why, why 23andMe, and I think it's, um, it bears sort of going into a little bit of background story here because it leads into what I'm doing now. Um, but as Joel mentioned, I had been working at AFI Metrics, but prior to that, I was at Perlage and Sciences, which was a spinoff of AFI. And we were um, building really the world's first genome-wide chips. We did our own HAP map. We picked 250,000 SNPs to put on an array. And then my job was to go out and try to find DNA samples to now put against those chips. And that proved to be way more difficult. Uh, we ended up run, running an ad in Science and uh, got one guy from Mayo Clinic to respond. He was a neurologist and he had DNA samples from patients with Parkinson's, which ended up probably being one of the most um, eventful things in my life, getting that email. It's how I turned out to meet Sergey Brin, the co-founder of Google. And I've, it seems like I keep um, bumping into the world of Parkinson's research for, for a number of reasons. But it was during that time that, because we were running into all this difficulty of finding DNA samples to power studies, uh, then when I was at Affymetrics, saw the same issues where researchers were trying to get grant money and really having a hard time finding sizable enough chunks of money to do uh, studies that would have statistical power. Uh, in fact, one study I was working on with a guy at UCSF um, in epilepsy, he got the funding, but then his budget got cut, so he had to cut the number of samples he was going to genotype in half. And so seeing this over and over again, and then having moved around the country just um, by happenstance, I lived in the D.C. area, lived in Boston, lived in San Diego and San Francisco because of my husband's job, but I think I just kept sort of seeing these same things over and over again, and it gave me kind of an interesting perspective on what was going on specifically in genetics research. And that's really what led to the formation of 23andMe. It was really always about how do we do research in a new way, but to make it interesting to individuals, we provided this interface so that people could start to learn more about their genome and what their potential risks were for certain diseases. And of course, I'm sure most of you have read about the, the trials and tribulations with the FDA, but it looks like a lot of that is being, or at least some of that is being figured out, which is very encouraging. Um, but while I was um, at 23andMe, I ended up going to a walk for autism. Uh, I was really, I had a lot of friends who had kids with autism, and I was really curious about this condition. And it was really revealing to me to go to this walk in San Francisco and see the broad spectrum of a condition. And so going back to my Perligen days, we had this sort of naive assumption that we could just pluck DNA samples out of a database, put them in a machine, and voila, we would have our answer of what causes autism. Um, I've come to learn now that it should be called autisms. There are many different phenotypes in this, in this spectrum, and it's really kind of a misnomer to call this even a disease diagnosis. And so a lot of these thoughts have led to the formation of We Are Curious, which is really a, a, a new approach to starting to assemble our own personal data. And certainly with the advent of um, the wearables now that, that um, we've been seeing coming on the market, I would say a lot of them are probably first generation. The picture of the woman in the middle is a, a friend of mine, Rachel, who um, this is her shtick now. She goes around with all of these wearables on. And I wonder about 
what's going on. I don't know how she keeps all the batteries charged. That would be my biggest challenge with that. Um, but the point is, is that we are now able to tap into a lot of our own personal data, both through the wearable space, as well as our, our microbiome, our genome, uh, other places where we might have breaks in our DNA. The point being that where do we put all of these data once we start to um, create them? And um, on top of that, there's a lot of experiential things that we could start to capture. What are symptoms of a disease we might have that we would want to track? Migraine is a very good example of a, of a condition or a, a disease or whatever you want to call it that people have. It's very chronic. It's not something that necessarily gets tracked in our medical record. I myself am a, a sufferer of migraines, but now I have a place at Curious where I can create a, a tag called migraine and I can track when I have one. And then if I have a suspicion about what might be triggering the migraines, I can track those things as well. The idea, the idea being to start to stack all of this data on top of, it, of each other to look for patterns and see if there might be some correlations going on. So the, the point of, of Curious really is that it's really up to you how you want to interact with the platform. It can either be a, an N of one. You can just go in and track your own data personally. You don't have to share it with anyone. You don't have to com have a conversation with anyone around it. But you might be able to learn some things just by doing your own tracking. Um, but at N of many, there's this opportunity to join groups of people who have a shared interest, who might want to either cheer each other on if they're doing some kind of a tracking protocol or just compare notes and, and compare theories that they have about different things. Um, it, and it's singular to social. You can either do this without interacting with other people, or if you'd like to, you can find people who are like you and share your ideas. Um, you also have the ability to have full privacy of your data all the way to full sharing and everything in between. So there might be certain data sets that you would want to share with researchers at your favorite research institution or um, with your hospital, with your doctor, um, or if you want to just keep things private, you have that option as well. And I think that's really the, the control piece of this is, that will be really important to individuals as, as they start to realize how much of their own data they're going to be able to assemble. Um, we're having conversations around setting up a universal ID, um, and um, Mike Blum was here yesterday. I know this is one of his uh, hot topics, but we're very interested in being part of this data ecosystem, and if there's a way for us to merge a, a universal ID into the platform, we're very interested in having discussions around that. But our goal really is to become the survey monkey of personal data tracking. What I mean by that is um, I've talked to small even t tiny foundations where their patients are coming to them and saying, you know, I really want to share more of my data with you. How do I do that? And they've gone to the lengths of building their own tracking platform. They don't have a budget for it. They don't have an, an entire engineering team to do these kinds of things. And it seems like it, it's, um, it's a gargantuan task for something that if you had the ability to just go out and say, okay, let's just use this other platform, like SurveyMonkey for surveys. So we're very um, interested in, in seeing our platform used in that way. So we have the ability for a research organization to come in and build a tracking protocol that then they would serve up to the participants. And then all that, excuse me, all that data would be shared back to the research organization through a consented process. So we're working on that. That will be in a further iteration of the platform. Um, but the whole um, thought process behind this really is um, partly around quantifying disease. Um, as, as most of you in this room probably know far better than I, there are difficulties with disease labels. Um, they don't really mean so much in the chronic disease space especially. Um, one of the areas that I've been focusing on again is in autism where uh, when you look at families and you talk to them about what their kids are experiencing, um, the two kids can have very different symptoms, very different behaviors, and um, the naivete that we had at Perligen, again, that we could just pluck samples out of AGREE, which is the Autism Genetic Resource, Resource Exchange, and throw them in a DNA sequencer and voila, have an answer, it's, it just doesn't work that way. So in the process of having discussions with people in the autism community, I met a woman, Elizabeth Horn, who has a daughter with autism. And for 18 years now, she's been on the path of trying to figure out what's going on. And she has talked to more and more families. And uh, she finally came to a point where she developed this organization called Compass. And what Compass is about is really looking in all directions, looking for data of all sorts to try to sort out what is going on with these kids and why they end up with different symptoms, why they some recover, 
Some never do, and why is that? What's different about these children that we might be able to learn earlier in the diagnosis to see if there are interventions that could work? Um, so this is an example of using the Curious Platform and tracking a child with autism. Um, I scrolled down on the right side of the screen there just to show you all the different tags that have been created just to track the seizures of this um, child. They have a lot of precursors they've noticed, and, and this child is actually schooled at home, and so her teachers are, are tracking as well and keeping tabs on what's going on throughout the day. Um, and they start to see these seizure precursors showing up, and now what they're trying to do is can they predict when a seizure is going to happen, or meltdowns or other things that they've tagged that become part of her behavioral profile. So this is an ongoing project, and we're uh, going to be adding more people to the platform and expanding this out to other areas. We're mostly in the San Francisco Bay Area at this point, but uh, we're starting to grow. We have a number of people actually in New York who are joining uh, the coalition. The other disease that we're um, also deciding, not like <laughs> we like to pick difficult things, but um, chronic fatigue is another area where patients are actively engaged in collecting their own data. Um, it's actually been recategorized by the Institute of Medicine as SEID, Systemic Exertion Intolerance Disease. Um, and we have a particular technology. I'm actually wearing this ring. Um, it's called Aura, O-U-R-A. It's a technology for tracking sleep in particular. Uh, we think just by implementing this wearable into uh, a group of patients who have chronic ME-CFS, we might start to learn some things just by looking at their sleep data. But then on top of that, they will also be able to track their symptoms in the form of tags and also their treatments to start to put that data set together. Again, with the idea being that this is something that might generate some hypotheses that we can then share with the research community. And then moving on to precision prevention. Um, this is something that, um, Again, I think most people are aware of, of, of really how this is impacting our society, not only in the U.S., but worldwide, uh, leading causes of preventable death and disability in the U.S., um, according to the CDC. Half of all citizens, seven, 117 million in the U.S., have chronic disease, and a third of 70, uh, 78 Amer million Americans are obese. Most of these things are preventable, and um, it's an area where we think that personal data tracking could have huge impact. Unfortunately, it's not going to be solved in a hospital. Uh, we think a lot of these data will be uh, retained mostly by individuals, but portions of that will be shared with their physicians and with their, um, again, the research that might be going on in their area that they feel might be useful or helpful. Where it's going to start, really, is in our diets. Uh, I think most of you know that our diets in the U.S. are pretty horrendous. Uh, we don't really even seem to know what works best for a particular person, whether they should be more paleo, more veggie, more Mediterranean. It's, it's a big, huge question that people have. And so if they're able to track the foods they eat against how they feel, their energy levels, uh, different markers that they might be able to start obtaining if companies like Theranos are able to come back on the market. Um, we're, we're very curious about what these numbers are, not just once a year when we go in and have our physical exams. It's also going to start with monitoring our environment. We think that's another area where there's really interesting data. Going back to the, the autism example, one of the things that the teachers were noticing is they had put an environmental monitor in the classroom. And twice now, when this child has been having a seizure, the CO2 monitor has been going off, or the, the alarm has been sounding. They had no idea if it has anything to do with it, but it's an observation that now we're going to track more closely. And sleep is huge as well. Uh, we, I don't think we even have scratched the surface on the importance of sleep in our society. And uh, now that we have wearable technologies that are going to allow us to track it more accurately, uh, we are very excited about where this could take us in understanding uh, human disease. And then, of course, exercise. Um, I, I love this woman. <laughs> um, this is something that is just huge. I've got a lot of friends now um, that they call themselves elderly, that um, they just swear by getting up and moving all the time, and we can't stress this enough. But what I think we're seeing, and especially with this advent of wearables, um, even though the data from the first generation of these devices probably isn't that great, 
what we do see is that people have, now they start to set a goal of, I, I should be taking 10,000 steps every day. And that number becomes important to them. And if they can achieve that on a daily basis, they start to feel better. Whereas before, when they weren't really keeping track of it, they didn't set that, that um, guidepost for themselves, and they really did not follow through. So I think we're going to start to see these advances and these changes in behavior because now people are paying closer, to at at closer attention to their own, their own data. So I'll just close with a quote that came out of a book that I'm reading, The Digital Doctor by Bob Wachter. Patients possess a body of knowledge about themselves that we can never hope to master, and we have a body of knowledge about medicine that they can never hope to master. Our job is to bring these two groups together so that we can serve each other well. I couldn't agree more, and that's the part that, that Curious wants to focus on, of, of helping individuals gather their data and then bringing that to the medical establishment. Thank you very much. We have a minute or two for questions, if anybody wants to step up to the microphone. A very interesting talk. So what do you see as the future relationship between We Are Curious and various attempts to create personal health records? It's a, a great question. So one of the things we're assuming is that, and, and one of the things I didn't really touch on is the ability in the future for people to download their medical record into Curious. So that's the, this blue button. Uh, process that isn't really implemented yet, but that's something we see in the future where if people do want to bring their data into Curious, they have the ability to do that. Right now they can upload it manually, uh, which is something I've actually been doing, and it's sort of akin to timeline on Facebook where you can just go back and start to enter in that data manually. But um, yes, I think that's, and it sort of de facto becomes a personal health record when you're starting to bring in all of this information. So yeah. Hi, good morning. Um, in light of your work with Google, or folks involved with Google, what thoughts have you given towards data privacy? Um, you know, some say when Edward Snowden broke, I mean, well, shared all that information, um, that actually Google has more information about our behavior, and now to add our healthcare information adds a whole new perspective to this and a whole new dimension. So any thoughts towards that and how, how we should evaluate that? Yeah, well, it's, it, it's part of these platforms that we're building, that building in as much security and privacy around data. But I think it's more important to focus on, or, or as important to focus on, the ability to control it. So control really is, I think, part and parcel with privacy, uh, because we can't decide for people when and how they want to share their own data. But if we can give them the confidence that when it's held privately, it is held privately as much as possible. But then if they choose to share it, I, I think that sense of control gives people that sense of, of power over their data. And, and getting more value out of it, I think, is really important to people, especially we were talking this morning about people who've been through a cancer treatment. And they would love to share information about that experience outward and beyond themselves to other people who might be going through that process. So I I think the control thing is probably the most important component of it. So I'll ask a quick question. It strikes me that a lot of this information flow is from the platform to the patient. Where and when does a healthcare provider enter into this mix? Uh, so that's another piece of this that we're working on, the ability to share pieces of the data. And from the previous presentation, yes, it, I don't think a doctor's going to want a whole deluge of, of data coming from a patient, but if they can uh, compartmentalize it down to some meaningful bit of information. So as a matter of fact, our, my co-founder uh, was on a, a particular treatment, and she was tracking her migraines and other symptoms that she had. And she could show that when she started a particular treatment that a lot of these other symptoms really subsided. And she shared that with her doctor, and her doctor seemed to really appreciate seeing that graph of that data. It wasn't, it wasn't like 23andMe where it was a gene, you know, which yeah. the genetic stuff is, is a little bit more puzzling, I think, to some doctors. But when it's, it's, it's symptoms that are tracked in a treatment, it becomes a very useful and a, a, a good conversation starter. Great. All right, two final questions here and then here. That was a great talk. Uh, it's you. really interesting to see what We Are Curious is doing to, to really contextualize personal data. I think following on Dr. Friedman's question about integrating it into clinical workflows, are you planning to work with partners like Validic and HealthKit to be able to take that data and push it? Is that, is that on your roadmap? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Great question. Final question. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Uh, since you mentioned uh, fat fatigue or chronic fatigue as being one of the issues, 
Have you thought or could you comment about um, possible looking at NTM, non-tuberculosis microbacteria, which has been uh, labeled as an orphan disease, but it's been increasing a lot since 9-11 uh, uh, baby boomers are coming in with the uh, skinny ladies having pulmonary problems that are causing chronic fatigue is the main problem? Oh, I, I, I would love to hear more about that. Yeah, we're all about any theory and, and any group of patients who might have a similar experience like that. If we can bring them into the platform and have them bring as much of their data as they can, uh, we're, we're looking at, we want to turn over every stone we can. And the people I'm working with are very, I think they'd be very interested in that. We could talk after this. That'd Thank be you. great. Thanks. Excellent. That was Thank super. You.